Hello and welcome to the stock out. This is your show at Freight Waves for the CPG and retail industries. I'm one of your hosts, Mike Bowdenbistel, joined by Grace Sharkey. Grace, good to see you. You've been talking a lot about fraud. Yeah, yeah can we let's let's see if we can avoid crime today on the show. Let's see if we can uh, possibly do that. I mean, uh, it, it looks like we have some, of course, a lot of earnings to go through, but uh, um, I, I, I did see a couple of interesting Amazon warehouse fraud situations, but hopefully we'll, we'll stick to some, some updates in the earnings sector uh, this time around. <laughs> that sounds good. Well, it would be criminal to miss this show because um, <laughs> we're going to boil down what's important from last week's earnings um, for shippers in the retail and CPG industries. So we'll start with UPS. So UPS was one that you know, I don't usually always pay attention real closely to the parcel um, companies, but um, you know, wanted to look at that closer last week because there was so much volatility in the stock price. So you can see the stock price that that came down from you know close to one hundred and fifty dollars a share to one twenty eight. So that really got my attention on Tuesday. This was this was the worst performing stock in the S and P five hundred. Um, and so I went and, and listened to their earnings call, went through their press release, and you know, what was so interesting about this was that. You know, we talk a lot on this show about consumers trading down from higher price products to lower price products. Well, their shippers are really doing the same thing, where the the UPS shippers are, um, you know, trading down to a lower value service. So they're seeing more ground, ground growing faster than air. What they call this uh, sure post or smart post growing faster than the higher service forms of of trucking. So sort of put some numbers around that the air. Cargo volume down seven percent, um, while ground increased uh, two point three percent. And then the sure post, which is the value offering, grew twenty percent. And um, so, so the the lower value, lower service offering, growing you know much faster. They did attribute a lot of that to um, to, to some of this new e commerce business. So there's a lot, been a big influx of cheap e commerce. They call it lightweight freight. I don't know. Is this like to to move? Or some of these, um, you know, Shein and some of these Chinese, uh, you know, companies. But but in any event, those are growing a lot faster, um, and it's it's hurting their their comps, their revenue per piece down two point six percent in the U.S. domestic transportation segment. They do it, attribute a lot of that to mix, um, and then they expect their um, volume expectation for the second half is they expect volume. Um, when you exclude Amazon, which is the largest, uh, their largest customer, to grow less than one percent. In the second half, so they're a little bit tepid on the economy. It, it, it feels like it's that's part of why, when you looked at that stock uh, chart a minute ago, why it's why it's been down is a lot of of, of um, investors view this as kind of a play on the overall economy. Um, you see it drop, and it wasn't just in the last week. I mean, you see it's 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 fallen a lot. Um, you know, in, in the last twelve months, it's a, a twelve month uh, chart. Um, but another takeaway here is on the automation where. You know, you know, we all know the company. Um, you know, we had these these big, you know, union wage increases uh, in the quarter. Their union wages rose eleven percent versus where they were a year ago. They're about to lap um, that renegotiation that, that got so much attention last year. Uh, they, so they make a bigger push to improve efficiency, reduce the number of, of union hours by one percent, um, while the volumes grew one percent. So, um, so so more efficiency there, and they're routing more volume through automated facilities. And so they're able to close some facilities and then greater usage of these RFID tags, which are allowing uh, also allowing cons- customers to print those RFID tags um, later this year. So a lot going on in the, on sort of the automation side. And so I guess what this tells us for, for, for shippers, when you look at sort of that revenue per piece, it doesn't seem like UPS has a tremendous amount of, uh, of, of pricing power just because the, the volume doesn't seem to be constrained. Um, even if you sort of think of UPS as kind of being a duopoly with with, with FedEx for the most part, um, so it does seem like there's also lots of capacity in the air network, uh, with with volume shifting more to the ground. It seems like you should expect lower human touches if you're a FedEx uh, or a UPS customer, and it doesn't sound to me like they're expecting maybe as much of a crush of packages. I mean, they always say, well, they're expecting a sort of record number right around December 18th. They also did say that there's a shorter window, which I guess I hadn't realized between Thanksgiving and, and Christmas, only 17 days between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So it's another reason why maybe the, the peak season might be pulled forward, which is something we've seen in a lot of the um, in a lot of the, the, the data 
you know, so far. And then also sort of related to this, uh, there was an article on FreightWaves.com that Eric uh, Kulish uh, pub published, uh, FedEx to cut daytime domestic flight activity by 60%. You know, you think of FedEx primarily being overnight um, is, is when they have those those flights, they bring everything into Memphis. And then from there, they use Memphis as a hub. Um, but I guess this is re related largely to the, um, you know, termination of this postal service, you know, contract. Um, so that has big implications for, you know, FedEx pilots. So capacity coming out of the, the air freight, um, you know, market there. So it just, it seems like there's less traffic moving by, by, by air, at least, uh, you know, domestically. So Grace, what did you think about all these um, developments at, in, on the personal side? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I'm, Clearly, they they brought it up, but it's interesting to see the fact that uh, you are seeing the pricing power just being completely diminished. And if anything, shippers are asking, I think, uh, for for better pricing overall. It sounds like that surge as well as is this lightweight type of uh, packaging or, or shipment, but also it's lightweight in in short lanes and short zones as well. So you're not getting as many miles out of it, which means, of course, that's going to affect pricing and, and revenue too. So I mean, it's kind of interesting to see that a little bit in the, the trucking space as well as those shorter runs. People are coming a little bit more uh, strategic, right, of where they're putting warehouses that some of these these smart, small parcel packages, right, don't have to go too far as, as far as they've had to go in the past. And, yeah, I mean, to bring up Shein and, and, and Timu, like, they are doing their best, too, to bring in more bulk into the United States to avoid a lot of the the newer um, uh, customs problems, right? So even those shipments are, are being are, are shorter as well, so you're not seeing those coming from overseas. They're coming from strategic warehouses across the United States too. So yeah, I, I caught that too. Uh, it was interesting. It sounds like they're doing, uh, they had an interesting acquisition, right, uh, in Mexico. So uh, ex excited to see maybe how, how that uh, turns around as well with all the nearshoring. Um, mm -hmm. They are the only uh, company still that's doing Saturday, which Again, not sure. I'd like to see like if that's really bringing it, if, if it's if it's worth uh, having. Uh, but it is interesting to point out, and I agree with you clearly. Freight tech is my thing. Uh, not surprised to hear about the, the operational uh, updates that they're they're looking to do. It makes sense, um, and sounds like a big part of their dispatching of trucks now is like being almost cut in half with how many employees they need to have for that. So. Uh, hopefully that that will help them remain competitive. But yeah, it's just the it sounds like it, in general that the air freight space is, is starting to, to die down um, a little bit more. Which uh, I, I, you're not seeing that right as much internationally per se. But I think the big problem is with a lot of those custom changes. Right, we're seeing a lot of those international shippers come in with large bulk, and then what they are shipping through some of these providers is really short run. So. Uh, we'll see how that maybe affects them and their their product offering moving forward. Yeah, that's a great point. Just the contrast between what we've seen in the domestic um, air freight market and the international air freight market. The international air freight markets are really tight um, because a lot of these uh, you know e-commerce products that have traditionally not gone air freight are going air freight. So, um, so so really, it seems like on the domestic side, there's still a lot of freight moving. It's just maybe less time sensitive, or at least the shippers are not willing to pay for the expedited service. So um, interesting uh, stuff uh, there. Why don't we move on to another one, which this one was more surprising. I mean, I, I sort of understood more yeah. why the, the, the UPS um, stock fell off. Um, you know, PACAR uh, stock uh, fell off also. So that stock was down 11%. So this is a, a chart of a PACAR that goes back to um, middle of 2023. So one year chart. But last week that went from $110 a share to, um, and now it's at 99, 24 has been as high as 125 in March. And what's interesting is, is it started rising right around November of last year from November through, through, through April. So it did seem like there was speculation that uh, trucking carriers would start ordering again, or at least um, from my experience in finance, some of the, the, the hedge funds will step in when they think that orders can't get any worse for trucks because good orders tend to move the the, the stock price. Um, so uh, maybe they, they jumped the gun there a, a little bit. So 
Stock was down 11% last last week um, on Tuesday. Um, you know, I listened to the call and I didn't hear anything that was terribly surprising. I mean, they did say that they expect a decline in the number of U.S. trucks or, or trucks manufactured because Class 8 heavy, heavy duty trucks manufactured in both the U.S. and Canada to decline about 15% from about 305,000 trucks to about 260,000 trucks. Now, to, to us at, at Freight Waves, that seems pretty par for the course, considering mm -hmm. that uh, the freight market has been weak. I mean, these these, these tend to be um, sort of late cycle companies. Um, and so you would expect there to, to be fewer Kenworth and Peterbilt trucks. Those are the nameplates that um, Paccar produces in the US. And they produce a, a brand called uh, DAF in, um, in, in Europe. So you would expect there to be fewer uh, trucks manufactured. Um, they, they only missed consensus earnings um, by a, a penny. And uh, when you kind of look at the, the ACT, you know, research um, uh, orders, those tend to you know, be very seasonal. But um, and, and the, the spike, this this latest sort of order season was less than it than it typically would be. So this is um, what you're seeing there is, is ACT research uh, truck orders class uh, for for class eight trucks. Um, so a big spike towards the end of 2020. Another big spike towards the end of, of 2022, and then you know, sort of less of a spike in 2023. There, you know, tend to be certain months of the year where there's a lot more ordering activity than than, than others. But um, you know, to me, did you have a chance to look at at, at Packard? I mean, I, I saw that um, Alan Adler wrote this up a little bit, and you know, he didn't think it was too bad either. Um, and, and also, Packard's gaining market share. Their market share went from what is it, 27 percent to 33 percent. So people do seem to like their brands. It's a really well capitalized company, kind of a cash flow, um, good cash flow generator as well. Yeah, it sounds like they're making some interesting investments uh, in, in Latin America, South America as well. Uh, I mean, even in their parts sector, they talked about uh, like a strong 30% margin, if I remember correctly, and, and seeing growth in that too. So uh, I was as equally confused again, maybe we're just in a situation where it's like us in our wonderful Freightways bubble understand the, the the trucking market a little bit better and the cyclicality of it as well and maybe that hasn't mm -hmm. uh gotten to, to some of uh its its shareholders pack our shareholders read more of our stuff and alan adler stuff maybe you'll have a better idea but yeah it was it, it was odd because it didn't seem uh it seemed like they were investing in the right areas that they're seeing growth in in some of the strong areas again they brought up you know, infrastructure um uh more infrastructure investment across the United States. They, they don't see is being a, that actually helping. Actually, they do see that helping uh, the company as well. So uh, again, yeah, kind of uh, flabbergasted a little bit by the movement, but nothing, if anything, some, like I said, interesting investments in different markets and happy to see the parts numbers too, which maybe some, if you're not selling as many tra trailers, right, you're, you're handling a little bit more parts. So happy to see that, but yeah, I was uh, kind of surprised by it as well. Yeah, that, that part segment has long been a growth area for them um, and, and continues to be. I mean, sometimes the growth in that part segment is sort of high single digits. Um, but yeah, I want to move on to, to um, the, the rail companies. So um, really pay particular attention to the, the intermodal side of things. And um, actually getting back to UPS for a second, there were two carriers that Men mentioned um, UPS when talking about their domestic intermodal volume being down. That you know, part of what was um, sort of hampering the intermodal volume on the domestic side a little bit was was the parcel. And both Norfolk Southern and Union Pacific highlighted that. And Norfolk Southern attributed to pressure that um, on the Teamsters to keep UPS drivers employed, so they would they had more volume over the highway that might have gone rail. So uh, I thought that was a, an interesting uh, you know comment. Um, you know, you wonder if that's a comment that, that that's actually in the best interest of the of the, of the shippers. Uh, it sounds like they're putting, um, you know, their em employees first. Um, but uh, one thing that was interesting was uh, Canadian National um, was was speaking about uh, sort of the the divergence of cargo coming into uh, the ports of Vancouver and particularly Prince Rupert, and instead coming into the the um, port of LA and Long Beach. And so, very consistent with what we have in sonar and so what we're looking here is this white line is part of uh is international intermodal volume so these are primarily 40 foot containers the white line leaving vancouver going eastbound the red is prince rupert that's where you've seen the biggest drop off so the prince rupert is um it's it's international intermodal it's primarily for u.s consumption centers 
So it's all the way from, goes from Northern British Columbia to Chicago and Memphis uh, primarily. And that's where you've seen the big drop off. And you've seen somewhat of a commensurate rise in um, international intermodal volume coming out of LA and, and Long Beach. Um, that's the green line. Now that's on a much larger scale. So it doesn't move the, the numbers uh, you know, quite as, as, as much on a relative basis. But uh, that's where there's been a lot of you know, divergence that, um, you know, CN talked about how they, they really saw a big, um, you know, pickup in this trend in June, and they expect it to persist through the end of, of August. They're not including any impact from work stoppages in their guidance. It could be work stoppages at the port. There could also be work stoppages on the railroad. So those things, can, you know, are, are up in the air. And then, um, you know, Union Pacific talked about that as well. They, they talked about that as, as being kind of a short-term positive trend for their international intermodal uh, volume coming out of um, California. And, uh, you know, so basically um, that's kind of the, the, the big trend there, international intermodal. They, they expect it to continue to be strong, um, but then you're, you're also seeing strength in domestic intermodal volume. And it did seem to confirm uh, the thesis that we've been putting out that there's gonna be more transloading from international containers into domestic containers which is logical because we've seen on the ocean market some shortages of the international containers. And so the logical way to address that would be to transload at or near the port complex into domestic containers. Um, and, and we're seeing that. So that's good news for the likes of JB Hunt, Hub Group, Schneider. Uh, means they're going to have more activity. Um, and then um, sort of related to that also, Norfolk Southern, one of the Eastern class ones, said that they've seen more repositioning of empty domestic containers back to the West Coast, um, you know, for that same for that same reason. Uh, and so it, should a shipper, question that then becomes, should a shipper be concerned about that? Um, and, and I would say probably not, uh, not, at least not yet. I mean, that, that could get into a capacity shortage on the West Coast. But when you look at Sort of intermodal spot rates have a chart on that, um, and so this is intermodal spot rates. The the white line is LA to Chicago. The orange line is LA to Dallas. Now, not not a lot of uh, intermodal volume moves on the spot market, um, but it's 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 a good indicator of are the carriers protecting capacity for the contra contractual shippers. And and right now those rates are still depressed, um, kind of not too far from where they were in 2019. Uh, sort of pre-pandemic levels and nothing like the spikes we saw, you know, during the pandemic period um, when there was a lot of, of, of busy, um, you know, ac activity there where there was uh, congestion at the ports and, and at various inland you know, points as well. Yeah, I think uh, the, the, like you said, the biggest concerns here and from what I've heard is, of course, those, those port, um, uh, job uh, negotiations, right? And I think, yeah, we're seeing some of that action. Plus, you bring in as well, uh, what we kind of talked about earlier with uh, the 17 days between Thanksgiving and Christmas. I'm sure we're going to see uh, impact on, on that market with that all coming in earlier, too. Uh, but I will say it sounds like that volume is starting to pick up, especially even on the truckload side, too. So I'm interested in kind of what the truckload rates start to to perform mm -hmm. out uh, in LA. I was some I saw a bunch of drivers kind of posting about it as well, um, and just being being a little bit cautious with that market, but being strategic too. So uh, that's something we can watch uh, over the next couple of weeks and see how that that intermodal compares. But you're right; it's it's just interesting to see. I mean, what was it? Wow, time flies. Uh, I mean, what a half a year ago? No, no, no. Be even longer than that almost uh three-fourths of a year ago right we had um uh, uh jb hunt announce uh their investments right within uh their offerings there it would be an sf as well so it's interesting uh, we'll see how that ends up paying out after a year of that that info coming out here uh in the next couple of months yeah, they think they they think everything's going well so far. I mean, based on the comments that they, they've said, I mean, they, they seem like they're on the right track uh, there. The, the, Perfect the timing, quantum, yeah. <laughs> the, the quantum service, yeah. Um, but yeah, I want to move on to the final. Might be the final topic today is um, there's a new Sonar Excel plugin which um, yeah. is gaining traction with customers. Customers have been requesting this for this for a long time. They're using it. They're liking it. Um, 
you know, we, I wrote up a blog on the FreightWave Sonar blog, which is a really good resource to go for sonar use cases. Um, the sonar marketing team has redoubled their effort to have content up there um, at least twice a week where you have some either you know, analyst or customer success person um, you know, write something up based on a discussion with a customer or some sort of interesting use case. And um, you know, did one um, the other day on uh, domestic, comparing domestic intermodal to uh, domestic truckload. And you know, leveraging there's an example of this um, this uh, you know spreadsheet here, which is uh, basically what I did was took um, basically set up an automated um, methodology for taking the sonar data, bringing it into Excel, uh, having it something that updates every day. And so these are the top the 15 densest domestic intermodal lanes uh, ranked in terms of density. So these are uh, 53 foot loaded containers shows what uh, the volume is, um, sort of how does that compare to the 52 week high, which is important. It sort of gives some indication of is there capacity in the lane or could it be could it be stretched? The empty container percentage is important because it tells you, okay, is this a head hole lane or is it a back hole lane? I mean, some of those are obvious, but some of them are maybe not like Harrisburg to Chicago. About 35% of the domestic containers moving in that lane are empty. So it suggests there's plenty of uh, intermodal capacity there, um, and then have the intermodal uh, spot rates there and the dry van uh, spot rates, and basically saying that if those are far apart, like LA to Chicago, where you get a really deep um, savings from using rail intermodal, that it suggests that there's a relatively little competition that the intermodal industry is facing uh, from the truckload industry. Um, and that's true in about nine out of those 15 lanes. Uh, there are a few that are medium, uh, such as uh, Chicago to Harrisburg, where there's about a 12% um, discount when you look at uh, intermodal spot rates compared to truckload spot rates. And then a couple that are very close to parity, like Chicago to Dallas, or that Harrisburg to Chicago uh, lane, actually Chicago to Dallas, where it looks like um, the intermodal rates are actually higher than the, the, the truckload rate. So it seems like there's a lot of um, you know, trucking carriers willing to go on that two day route to, 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 to Dallas. Um, you know, I have heard some that maybe don't respect the hours of service rules in that uh, particular lane and, and try to do it all in, <laughs> in, in one day, which we do not advise at F, F rate waves. <laughs> um, I've heard truckers say, well, you, you have to you know, break the hours of service rules, otherwise you get stuck in Oklahoma. <laughs> True, but the, the law says you can't do that. <laughs> So, um, so, so interesting use case there, and um, you know, lots of different ways to to use the sonar add-in to, to customize things for um, for, for your, your needs. And I think it's it's going to be helpful for um, shippers when they put their lanes into a spreadsheet, pull, pull them all in, um, you know, the, just the lanes they care about, the the metrics they care about. Yeah, you know, I, I get, come from the broker space. I. I absolutely love this when i heard that we're doing this as a pass on our user i was like oh if only in, in in my day this would have been great i mean especially to showcase what you just brought up everyone go check a, a, that blog out as well i mean something like that for your teams that you're trying to maybe share a little bit more information on lanes and they might not be the most uh, what's the best way to say it? the most data science background. So that's super easy to read. That's very easy to share with the customer, share with carriers, explain why a different mode might be more advantageous in certain markets than others. Uh, and uh, just overall, I think a really great way for companies to be able to to take that data out of sonar and replicate it in a way that might be easier for their teams to understand. I mean, let's be honest, we're, uh, it's, I think we're going to be seeing different types of individuals uh, taking some of these carrier spots as, as we see technology, of course, get more involved with these transactions. So to be able to, to give them something that's easy to read, easy to learn from, easy to communicate uh, with customers and carriers alike. I mean, I, I love it. And I think that example of exactly what that tool allows you to do with Sonar is just uh, really a cherry on top of the, the Sonar Sunday. Yeah, it's really be, because, um, you know, the way to access the data and sonar is really was two ways you know, before that. You could either look at the at the UI um, or if you're sophisticated, you could pull it into an API, which a lot of the, you know, some of the hedge funds do that. Some of the um, yeah. big shippers that have a data science team behind behind them do that. Um, 
but for sort of the average person that maybe doesn't have a science uh, data science background, um, yeah, it's really difficult to to, to do that. Mm. And then you know, yeah. it, it, exactly. So this is this is kind of perfect. I think most people are familiar with Excel and can good at manipulating you know things in, in in there. And you know you can talk about how it's not as sophisticated as a um, some other system, but it's it's really what everyone knows. And it's kind of in a common language. Yeah, we talk about be able to, the ability in this industry to get your hands on data and and utilize it in a way that's going to make sense for for growing your company. And I mean, even something like this is going to be useful, I think, for for CFOs in this industry as well who don't have, like you said, that that more of a data science background or don't have the people on their team to pull from. So I love it. And I just realized we're running out of time here. So, hey, go check that out on uh, sonar.freightwaves.com. For everyone out there, thank you for watching the show. Join our newsletter. Go to freightwaves.com. Click on newsletters. There's a stock out right there. And until then, uh, we'll talk with you all next Monday.